Great, thanks. So, yeah, so it's today you're gonna hear from a lot of the other speakers about the future that we're building with machine learning and AI. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that same future, but through the lens of some different, simpler technologies that are really related to how that future is gonna unfold. And I'm gonna tell this in the form of a story, three-act story, and the story is about building a global supercomputer. So imagine that you want to build a global supercomputer. You can take for granted all the networking, all the storage, and that you have tens of billions of massively parallel compute nodes. There's two things you need to build to really kind of scale out onto, onto that kind of a network. You need to build a, <clears throat> a format for serializing that data between those nodes. You have to have some way of understanding what's going across those wires, and you need to have a protocol for how you can make a request from one node to the next, for how you can actually communicate. And we know that can work and build out a global, a global system like this because we have an example of it. We call it the World Wide Web. And so the hero of our story, I'm going to take you through a little arc, is Tim Berners-Lee, the man who invented the web in 1989. He invented this to solve the problem he was having on the early internet that when he was trying to collaborate with his colleagues around the world, data would often come to him in proprietary formats that required specialized software to understand. And he wanted to solve the problem by saying, what if we had a standard way of representing all these documents? And what if we had a standard protocol for identifying those documents' location and making a request? And so he invented HTML and HTTP. And these two technologies enabled us to have extremely simple software, browsers and web servers and web clients, that have really been what was the backbone of the last 30 years of the development of the web. Almost all the development of the web is really layers of abstraction on top of these simple existing protocols. And that was extremely successful, and he thought of this as a library, but I think of it a little bit through a slightly different lens as a supercomputer. If you think that those tens of billions or billions at this point of, of massively parallel compute nodes at the edge of that network aren't machines, but they're actually human brains, because the web operates by basically transmitting data, which then human brains read, interpret as knowledge, and click the button to take the next action. So if we move forward in our story, skip forward, skip forward a couple decades, we've gotten much, much better at producing, collecting, processing data with machines. But that architectural assumption of our supercomputer has leaked through into how we manage structured data. All of the machine-readable data we have mostly has metadata that is still proprietary formats, proprietary schemas, not really meant for mass interoperability. And that, and that makes managing data very hard. It makes understanding data you're getting from other sources very hard. It makes coming to, to data and doing anything meaningful with it very difficult. Our hero, Tim, foresaw this exact problem with the web that he had, he had brought into existence. And way back in 1994, at the first World Wide Web conference, in his closing keynote, talked about the fact that to the machines on the web, the web was fundamentally boring. Hyperlinks link one document to the next, but it's just a flat landscape of documents with no real meaning, and it's not until human beings read those documents and, rep and understand them as representations of real-world entities that they actually mean anything. And by 1999, this had gone into the Semantic Web Warping Group, whose mandate was to basically build a machine-readable format for representing data in that same, with that same concept, that it's about real-world entities and the relationships between them. And so the semantic web, or linked data, is about breaking data down into atomic facts, using universal identifiers to represent, the, to represent things, and the, the, giving us the ability to have shared semantic understanding of, of, of data. Those atomic facts you'll often hear referred to as triples, simple statements of the form subject, predicate, object, and these become a graph-like data structure because you can think about the entities you're talking about as nodes in a graph and as the relationships as edges. And so you start stringing together statements. I'm making three statements here. Ankara is a city, Ankara is the capital of Turkey, and Turkey is a country. And those nodes and edges form this graph-like structure. The next, the next concept is universal identifiers. So instead of just using simple local names that require a lot of context, use universal names for those things. And we, the URIs, universal resource identifiers, borrow from the URLs on the web as a really great distributed way of generating an infinite number of uni universally unique identifiers that have no ambiguity in them. So how does that apply? Don't try to read the small text, it's way too small. But the idea here is I've labeled all the nodes and edges with small UR with the URLs that uniquely identify those resources. And, and the idea here is why is this important? If I look at Ankara in a spreadsheet column, I know what that means. And if I look at Turkey in a spreadsheet column, I know what that means. There's no way I'm gonna get confused. 
But the reality is that that's actually, that, that's actually not true for machines. And, it's, it's, and, and what happens is, if you think about how these concepts are reflected in your brain, you have the concept of a turkey the, turkey the bird, and you have concept of turkey the country, and they're two very distinct things. You would never confuse them as being about the same thing. But when data uses these weak identifiers to talk about things, it's very easy to get confused. So what is this all, how does this all tie together? So if you, if you think about modeling your data this way, where the actual entities and the actual relationships are modeled as links, what you can do is you can leverage the existing infrastructure of the web to create a, a web of information, of actual knowledge, that people and intelligent machines can leverage equally well. That's the future. I think this is what we're building to, but I'm going to stop for, step back for a, a second and talk about where I think we're really in the middle of Act 2. So we've got this, we had the invention of the web and the insight of the web, and we've built data processing that's actually been super powerful, but created a lot of problems for organizations to kind of understand what data they have, what it means, how they can actually leverage it, and how do we, how do we pull those things together to move toward the future. So I'm going to go back one more time to our hero, Tim, who gave a great TED talk in 2009. He came out and talked about a lot of the same concepts I'm talking about here. And this was really kind of as the open data movement was moving. And his, his request to that TED audience, being forward-thinking folks who would be there at TED, was understand these concepts of linked data and how this is actually important for the future evolution of, of the web, and get your data out there. Bring data to the web. Get the flywheel going. And if you think about the, the classic knowledge pyramid, what folks are really start doing there, governments, nonprofits, and some corporations are bringing their data. And they're bringing the same disconnected data points that they have now out to the web. They're bringing raw data, CSV files, dumps of relational database, spatial data formats. But that data being out there is enabling the folks who actually are working to build this web of linked data to start to represent that data in this subject, predicate, object, atoms, and to start to form knowledge graphs that exist on the web that you can search that are really capturing the knowledge and enabling wisdom in the form of predictive and prescriptive analytics that can actually tap into that knowledge graph. And this makes me think about uh, you know, the, Will the William Gibson quote, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And another pyramid, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I think is really apt to think about how data is understood by the world today. You have some people in organizations who, you know, probably many people here, because you're here at Time Machine, way up at the top in self-actualization of data. You know how to leverage AI, you're doing wonderful things with it, or you at least have data self-esteem, where you, you, you're you doing a pretty good job and you can see the path there. But the majority of the world, the majority of of the people who are producing the, the most volume of data are really kind of still in food and shelter with their data. They have stockpiled data for the last decade. They're struggling to figure out how to actually empower their people to make data-driven decisions and trying to figure out how they can really bring in predictive analytics as a, as a powerful force. Um, they do know that everything is still based on Wi-Fi, though. You have to have Wi-Fi first. Um, we've, we've thought about, the, about that, that concept and, put, and you know, put together this simple maturity model. And you can tell we love to show this to investors and sales prospects because it has a line that goes up and to the right with a hockey stick in it. But there's something useful on, this, on the slide, too. You know, you, if you think about what we've done for the last 10 years is building out infrastructure and tool. We have, we've built out big data infrastructure. We've built out data science as a practice. We've made huge advances in, in machine learning and AI, but it's still very isolated and, and it's still very hard to get kind of the maximum benefit out of that. Now we're cataloging those things. We're inventorying them. We're, we're starting to, to kind of produce the raw metadata about what exists. And then we're applying governance, which is richer metadata, still mostly within the context of one company, one organization, but we're getting better at that metadata. And what happens on the other side of that? What's the end to that? Why do you do those things? Well, right now, today, it's still true and will be true for some time that most of the knowledge about what data mean are actually in human beings' heads. It's all the subject matter experts that work for your companies, that are part of your organizations. And when you really get a handle on what that metadata looks like, you empower those people to share and, and work with that knowledge, and that's what's gonna lead to richer semantic understanding that's gonna power both those people's work and machines' work going into the future. Uh, the flywheel that Tim was trying to start with, get your raw data out there, let's get that data out there so we can start working with it. I think it's equally important to think now about how we actually do that, that same flywheel working with people and get more people than just your highly technical data scientists really having an raw ac access to all of the data that they need to, to make the best decisions they can make. This is an example of some of the work we do, and it's a super eye chart, so don't try to read it, but I'll talk about what it is. This is some of the work we've done just researching hundreds of people, uh, of, of workflows, of how different types of people, different types of organizations, different types of teams 
work with data, what that process looks like, what can we abstract out that's common among all the different types of data work that goes on, and how that process looks and how different personas, different people, interact with that. So you've got your data scientists who have their part of the flow, and business analysts have a different kind of understanding. And there's data engineers who slot into a lot of those processes to really kind of prepare data and move it through pipelines, stakeholders and, and decision makers at the other end of it. But there's a commonality, there's a framework, there's a structure there. And if we can understand that and model that formally, we can actually start to extract that knowledge out, formalize it and crystallize it into knowledge graphs that can help, help get that flywheel moving. Uh, Quick, quick aside for, you know, just because this is a machine learning and AI conference, I felt like I had to have at least one slide that talked a little bit to that. This is just a really, really simple example of a model with some internal nodes labeled with strings. And, you know, this is the kind of thing you'd see in a textbook or as a very simple toy example. But what, what's gone on here is, you know, there's a, this is a, a model, probably, you know, in a real world, this would have been something that's learned. And those nodes are hidden nodes in the middle that are effectively some sort of op opaque concept that's been paint, that's been labeled here by a person to, to explain what, what, the what conclusions the model came to and why. And if you start thinking about what if those, those, instead of being labels that were put on so this could be published in a paper, but those were actually links into, into a knowledge graph, into a shared linked database of structured data, how much, how much better would that be for enabling explainable AI? How much better would that be for enabling transfer of, 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 of things learned from one model to the next? And bringing this back to just what is the, what is the next step? I, I really believe that building this supercomputer is inevitable, and I think that's a really easy prediction to make because we literally already have it. Everything I'm talking about here is it exists. It doesn't need any major innovation to actually make it take off. What it needs is content. It's actually just very sparsely populated. But what's happening now is as we're pushing the envelope with what's possible with machine learning and AI, which is what a lot of the other speakers here are going to talk about today, you're widening the gap between the people who know how to wield that and the people who can't. And the pressure to become part of this network, the pressure to make your data accessible to the broadest possible audience of people and then machines is going to become really is, is, is going to become a really a driving force. And I think over the next five to ten years, the same advancements that are going to help companies just struggling with how do I make my my people, my workforce more data driven are going to push the are, are going to push us toward this conclusion of the next evolution of the web, which is going to be equally accessible by people and intelligent machines. And in the words of our hero, who I've mentioned a bunch of times here, Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the web, this is going to make everything we've done with the web up to now seem completely irrelevant. Uh, thank you.